Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Chairman and Trustees of the Thistle Trust, may I welcome you once again to the Robin Chapel here in Edinburgh for our afternoon service. Today is the 16th Sunday in the season of Trinity. I'm Dr Ian Barclay, the Chaplain. I would like to welcome as our guest reader today a well-kent face from the Thistle Foundation, Gail Begg. Gail, it's wonderful to have you sharing with us once more in our service. To those who are joining us for the first time at worship, may I say how delighted we are that you're with us. To those who are here Sunday by Sunday, welcome once more. The order of service today is entitled The Evening Service and reflects that which will be used on the third Sunday of the month once the chapel reopens. In our worship, we are again ably supported by the voices of James Slimmings, our Director of Music, Sally Carr, one of our lay clerks, and Callum Robertson, our Assistant Organist, who come together as the Robin Chapel Music Group. Our call to worship today, from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing psalms to your name most high, to declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness every night. Let us worship God together. Let us sing to his praise and glory the bidding psalm, Psalm 25, verses 4 to 11. God shall endure for a. We shall sing it to the set tune Rockingham, and it can be found in Church Hymnary 4th edition as the hymn number 6. Our call to prayer today is from Psalm 141. May my prayer be like incense set before you, the lifting up of my hands like the evening offering. Let us pray. Let us pray in our prayers of adoration, confession, absolution and supplication, concluding with the collect for the Blues and Royals. In our prayers of adoration, let us approach God in humility and faith. 
Lord God of hosts, who is like you? Your strength and faithfulness, Lord, are all around you. The heavens are yours, the earth yours also. You form the world and all that is in it. Your throne is founded on righteousness and justice. Love and faithfulness are in attendance on you. Happy the people who have learnt to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. Your righteousness will lift them up. Blessed be the Lord for ever and ever. As we make our confession, let us do so with penitence and faith. Eternal God, we honour you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy to be praised by voices that are pure and by faces filled with light. But as the sun sinks to its setting and the twilight of the evening comes, we discern the darkness around us and within. We have not loved what you have commanded, nor desired what you have promised. Our wills have been unruly, our affections unsettled, and amid the passing changes of the world, our hearts have not been fixed on where true joys are to be found. In the absolution, you are now invited to receive his forgiveness in faith. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In our prayers of supplication, let us understand our place in his grace. Almighty God, teach us to live as always in your presence and to fold our hearts in your peace. Help us to rest on the strong love of Christ and by the power of his Spirit keep us from sinning, free us from worry, and guide us in the way we should go, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. And we offer the collect of the blues and royals. O Lord Jesus Christ, who by thy holy apostle has called us to put on the armour of God, and to take the sword of the Spirit. Give thy grace, we pray thee, to the blues and royals, that they may fight manfully under the banner against all evil, and waiting on thee to renew their strength, may mount up with wings as eagles, in thy name, who livest and reignest with the Father and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. I would now like to invite Gail to read the Old Testament lesson from the book of Jeremiah and following the hymn to read the lesson from the epistle of James. Gail. Our reading from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 11, verses 18 to 20. Hear the word of God. The plot against Jeremiah. Because the Lord revealed their plot to me, I knew it, for at the time he showed me what they were doing. 
I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realise that they had plotted against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But you, Lord Almighty, who judge righteously and test the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. Amen, and thanks be to God. The Robin Chapel Music Group will now sing Hymn 201, Worship the Lord in the Beauty of Holiness. Tune Morden in Church Hymnary, 4th edition. James, chapter 3, from verses 13 to chapter 4, verses 3, 7 to 8a. Two kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbour bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Submit yourself to God. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desire, the battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have, because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with the wrong motives, 
that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourself then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Amen and thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is to be found in that according to St. Mark in the ninth chapter, reading verses 30 to 37. This is the Gospel of Christ. Hear the Word of God. They left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were, because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Amen, and may God bless to us this reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Our anthem this week is And I Saw a New Heaven by Edgar L. Bainton. It is a setting of the first four verses of the book of Revelation, chapter 21. And I Saw a New Heaven. And I saw, and I saw, Shall 
Let us pray. Consecrate us, O God, by the truth. Your word is truth. Guide our minds by your Spirit, that we may understand your word, learn your will, and follow more closely in the steps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, they asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Last week we were with Jesus and what is often referred to as the Northern Ministry Route which had taken Jesus and the disciples as far north as Sidon. They had now returned to Capernaum, a journey which not only had given great opportunities to Jesus to teach, but also for the disciples to learn. Now here is a question. Have you ever prayed knowingly for the wrong thing? Something that you wanted, yet something that was not for you. It was not so much that this was something which had the name of someone else already on it, and that you were jealous. It was just something you wanted, perhaps because the alternative which was being offered to you was less than palatable, perhaps because you always had a hankering for whatever it was. Perhaps you couldn't even say why. You wanted it. You just did. Now, in a sense, this was what was happening here. Jesus gives the explanation backed up by teaching both in-depth and personal as well as general and public. This teaching was developed by demonstrations of divine power and influence. You could have been forgiven if you had only seen Jesus on one day in your life and you had not quite grasped his meaning. But these disciples were with him day in, day out, yet they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him. Did the disciples really still not know what Jesus meant? Or was it that little thing inside them, that jealousy, that caused them to argue about who is the greatest, that little thing that you and I have experienced when we've wanted something and we haven't really known why. 
It was because there was something the disciples themselves wanted that fitted into the great scheme of their thinking. The disciples' problem was that they were earthbound in their humanity. As such, they were unable to see Jesus spanning our human experience and introducing us to the divine experience. Have you ever been afraid to ask because you didn't understand? I seem to have lived through my life in school in that state, either not hearing, so I did not understand, or not grasping the strand of the argument and therefore failing to understand. Here were the disciples following a man who, to all intents and purposes, was a rabbi, hence the ascription teacher, one who would gladly and generously repeat what he had said or explain it in a different manner or demonstrate his teaching in a different way. All they had to do was ask. But the asking was too great a hill to climb, too great an obstacle to overcome. Why? Perhaps because in this instance or on this occasion, it highlights, it points back to our broken humanity. It points us back to the inadequacy we feel as human beings in certain circumstances when we wrongly adjudge our self-worth as being in deficit. But this passage says more than that. It says that these disciples were afraid to ask Jesus. It was not surprising that they were afraid to ask him as they were having an argument about who was the greatest. And this argument is clearly of considerable significance as it appears in Matthew and Luke as well as Mark. But lines of succession have always preoccupied the thinking of humankind. I recall that during my days as a chaplain in the army, some of my friends would watch the pattern of their colleagues coming and going. Would this padre leave at the end of a short service commission? Or would he extend to five years? And what would happen thereafter? But if he signed on for a regular commission, as one could do at that time, what impact would this bring to the line of succession? And so on, and a in a list of endless permutations. What is this doing? What is its impact? In some circles, it's called taking your eye off the ball as you relegate the priority to second place. In the context of the relationship between the disciples and Jesus, it is diminishing their relationship not only one with another, but also between them as a group and Jesus himself. That, in turn, diminishes the disciples' relationship with God, just as it would ours. We take our eye off the ball frequently. Whilst the small things in life are important, when we focus on them more than on the big picture, we are in danger of losing our primary focus. The primary focus is embedded in our relationship with God. As we lose that primary focus, we lose vitality. The vitality of the relationship that we have through God and Christ, energized as it is by the power of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. It is this relationship which enables us to do the wish and the will of our Father in heaven, and which is the essence of importance to him. This is the very thing which will make us great in his eyes, eyes that are infinitely more significant than the eyes of men. When we take our eyes off the ball, we also lose humility. We should recall that the disciples had been given power directly from Jesus. When we use the gifts of God for the glory of God, all is well. 
when we use these same gifts for our own ends, then we lose our own direction. When the preacher preaches with the intention of setting God before others, that is fine. Whether the sermon is good, bad, or indifferent is not the issue. It is the precedence of God in human life that is being revealed. That is of the essence. But when the preacher places himself before the word of God in such a manner that the focus falls on him, humility is lost and arrogance risks becoming his new bedfellow. So what did Jesus do? He could have given them a stern warning of where they were going wrong. He could have rebuked them, or as we would say in Scots, he could have given them a flea in the ear. Instead, he lifted up a child and said, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. The point was made. The point was taken. The point is made. But has the point been taken? Amen. And now to God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, be glory and praise, now and for ever. Amen. Our paraphrase today is paraphrase 30. Come, let us to the Lord our God, and we shall sing it to the tune Kilmarnock. It can be found as the hymn 482 in Church Hymnary, 4th edition. Him four hundred and eighty two. Let us now offer our prayers of thanksgiving, dedication, intercession for the faithful departed before concluding with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Let us offer our thanksgivings. We praise you, O God. We give you thanks, the God of nature and the God of grace, and the giver of all good. For the world you have made with its wonderful landscapes, its changing seasons, its teeming life. For the life you have given us, with its opportunities and responsibilities, its routines and delights. For the history we have inherited, with its treasures of art and science, and its variety of ordinary human goodness. 
for the joy and care of our homes, for the food that we eat and the friendships we cherish and the health we enjoy. For all the bounty of your providence we praise you and bless your holy name. We praise you that you are the one who at the appointed time sent your Son, born of a woman, to live and work in our world, to seek and save the lost, to suffer and die on the cross, to rise victorious over death, and to rule at your right hand for ever. We thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to the Church and to the world, to lead us into truth, to point the way to goodness, to increase among all people the spirit of sympathy and understanding. Make us worthy of your goodness. Open our hearts to love and praise you, and inspire us always to live for your glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and for ever. Amen. Let us dedicate ourselves to the glory of God. Gracious God, when your kindness and generosity dawned upon the world, and you lavished your love upon us in Jesus Christ our Saviour, you called us to believe in you and to devote ourselves to good works. Now we bring our lives to you and offer them with all that you have given us, with joy for your service, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us intercede for others. God of all kindness, you gave your only Son because you loved the world so much. We pray for the peace of the world. Move among us by your Spirit. Break down barriers of fear, suspicion and hatred. Heal the human family of its divisions and unite it in the bonds of justice and peace. We pray for our country. Enrich our common life. Strengthen the forces of truth and goodness. Teach us to share prosperity that those whose lives are impoverished may pass from need and despair to dignity and joy. We pray for those who suffer. Surround them with your love. Support them with your strength. Console them with your comfort. And give them hope and courage beyond themselves. We pray for our families, for those whom we love, protect them at home, support them in times of difficulty and anxiety, that they may grow together in mutual love and understanding, and rest content in one another. We pray for the Church. Keep her true to the Gospel and responsive to the gifts and needs of all. Make known your saving power in Jesus Christ by the witness of her faith, her worship, and her life. Let us commemorate the faithful departed. Eternal God, we remember with thanksgiving those who have gone before us in the way of Jesus Christ. Keep us united with all your people in earth and in heaven. Grant that as we journey through the years, we may know joys that are without end, 
and at the last come to the abiding city where you reign in glory everlasting. And this we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Our closing hymn today is the hymn 449, Rejoice, the Lord is King, and we shall sing it to the tune Darwell's 148th. It can be found in Church Hymnary, 4th edition. The hymn 449. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each one of you in this day and always.